Thanks so much, Bhavna and Andy, for inviting me to speak to you all today. And I'm, I'm thrilled to, to meet you all virtually. Thank you so much. Um, I am just going to share my screen. So let me just make that a slideshow. There we go. Can everyone see? Well, don't worry if you can't see the slides. I'm going to be talking through everything. They're more of a crutch for myself um, to, to remind me what I want to say. But can everyone see the full screen? Yes, I think you can, that, if you can. Yes, I can see the screen. Brilliant, Thank brilliant. You. OK, so uh, um, very quickly, Andy, will you be able to let people in if there's a wait in, in the waiting room? Is that I right? am doing. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, brilliant. Oh, thank you. Brilliant. OK, well, so, yeah, so and Andy emailed me and asked if I would uh, give a talk today to all of you um, about three topics. So uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome, uh, the Gene Vision website, and a little bit about the genetics behind Stargardt's disease. Um, and as Bhavna uh, introduced me, so I'm a professor of molecular ophthalmology and I have uh, two research labs, one based at UCL Institute of Ophthalmology and the other at the Francis Crick Institute, where uh, I, my group are basically trying to understand uh, the disease mechanisms behind inherited retinal diseases and also trying to identify novel targets for which we can then go on to develop treatments for patients and what we also do is a lot of kind of clinical studies where we look at patients in a lot of detail so that we can work out how the disease progresses over the course of a lifetime um, and what markers we can also use for clinical trials um, and I'm a consultant working at Moorfields and Great Ormond Street. And so I see a number of patients with Stargardt's, but also um, many other of the genetic eye conditions. So an overview of today. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about Charles Bonnet syndrome, what it actually is and why it's relevant to Stargardt's disease. And as I mentioned, the Gene Vision website, and I'm gonna actually use that to talk about um, Stargardt's disease in general um, and go over some of the basics um, of, of genetics. So Charles Bonnet syndrome was first described by a gentleman called Charles Bonnet, who was an 18th century philosopher. Um, and he actually recounted his grandfather's hallucinatory experiences in his published work. Now, Charles Bonnet syndrome is defined as visual hallucinations that occur when individuals are losing their sight. And this is really related to the process of not receiving the signals from the retina in the brain, and then the brain responding to that loss of vision by generating these visual images. This is not because of any form of mental health problem, and that's really important to emphasize. So visual, these visual hallucinations can occur in any age group and from any eye disease. Now, it's been commonly um, thought to occur in the elderly population. And that's because the elderly suffer from glaucoma, diabetes, age-related macular degeneration. But we know that it also occurs in rare diseases, so inherited retinal diseases like Stargardt. And importantly, it can occur in children, young adults, and, and the elderly. We don't know the exact incidence, so we don't know how many people are actually affected by this, but studies have shown that up to 30% of patients who are losing their vision can develop these visual hallucinations. And again, it's important that you, the take home message is there are no auditory hallucinations. So you don't hear things and you don't feel things. These are just visual hallucinations. There are really two main types of visual hallucinations that, that people can experience. Sometimes these are just simple, repeated patterns, geometric shapes, grids, bridwork, brickwork patterns. But sometimes those hallucinations can be complex. So people can see objects like 
uh, like multiple cars in a road which was otherwise usually empty. They can see foliage. Um, they can see people's faces, animals. And some of these complex hallucinations can be quite menacing. So, but, but equally, some people see very comforting hallucinations as well. So why do people develop these visual hallucinations? Well, we don't understand exactly why yet. And there is a lot of research going into this and, and there are teams across the UK that are doing studies where they do um, MRI, MRI brain scans to look at the parts of the brain that are triggered when patients are getting these hallucinations. And the general consensus is, at the moment is that essentially when you start to lose your sight, and if, for example, in Stargots, it's your central vision that has a defect in it initially. And so the signals from that central area are not being passed to, to the right part of the brain, which should receive them. It's getting signals from your peripheral vision, but not your central. And so some patients actually have this hyperactivity in the brain. And so it essentially tries to fill in those gaps with a visual hallucination. So this is just a, a, an example. What I'm showing on the screen at the moment is just a crowd of people. And there are lots of faces in that crowd of people. Now with star guards, you might have the central area of your vision missing. And so you may not be able to see that face right in the center of the crowd. And as those signals are being sent to the brain, what happens is, is that in certain people, the brain tries to fill in that gap and it fills it in with some sort of pattern or face or image. And I've just flashed up a little, a little boy in an elf's outfit, which is completely bizarre. It doesn't fit in with what you think you should be seeing. And that's essentially what some patients with Charles Bonnet are experiencing. So we undertook a study because for a long time, we had no evidence that this was really happening in children and young adults. And so we wanted to address this because there, there is really no reason why, why it wouldn't happen in, in our younger generations. And so uh, we decided um, on anecdotal evidence that, you know, we weren't as doctors really asking patients about Charles Bonnet syndrome. There were a handful of cases that were in the literature saying that it could happen, but we really needed more kind of sturdy evidence. Um, and we wanted to raise awareness amongst healthcare professionals, amongst patients, amongst charities, support groups like Stargardt's Connected, because what we found recently, there's been a big campaign by a lady called Judith Potts, who is an incredible uh, lady. Her mother actually developed Charles Bonnet syndrome when she was in her 90s. She was in a care home. And when Judith was going to visit her, her mum one day started to say she, she, she didn't want to eat the food because it was grotesque. She started to see slugs on her, her plate of food. But Judith couldn't understand that. And so she, she started to look around in the literature and she found out that actually some people who had macular degeneration were actually developing these visual hallucinations. She went to a GP with this who said, she'd never heard of it and so then she was kind of even more trouble because she was then wondering whether or not her her mum may have some signs of early dementia but otherwise she was completely on the ball she she hadn't lost her faculties in any other way and then she came across this um, through basically looking through um, a google search in the literature and came up with charles bonnet syndrome she then approached one of the foremost experts in it called dominic fitch who basically reassured her that what her mother was suffering from was this condition but again this has very much been attributed amongst the older generation but through her campaigning more community groups and especially pre-covid people started to talk about this more when they had coffee mornings etc and more people started to say, actually, do you know what? I've had that or I am experiencing it. And so by raising awareness, we are now able to kind of 
spread the word so that people are not worried when they when and if they do suffer these conditions. Now with children, it's a slightly different um, issue because when they're very young, you may get confused whether or not they've got a pretend friend or if it's just make believe. But I think once children get to around six or seven, um, they become better at kind of explaining what what they're seeing and and you as parents for any of you in the audience can discern whether or not this is actually maybe related to their sight loss or if it is just you know a make-believe comment that, that they're um they're having so anyway going back to the study so so we wanted to see if this was actually the case and and look more um at, at what was going at least in our cohort at Moorfields so what we did is we searched through the electronic patient records of all children and young adults less than 25 years who'd attend Moorfields over a nine year period. And we searched for the keywords Charles Bonnet and visual hallucinations and we collected all the case details. Now what we, we found was that 13 patients were identified to have Charles Bonnet syndrome. 70% were, were male. Um, and the average age of onset was 11 years of age. Most of those patients had a reduced vision. So if you were looking at the uh, vision chart, they may only be seeing the top line or um, close to that level of vision. And six of those patients were registered as um, sight impaired or severely sight impaired. Interestingly, 62% of those patients had an inherited retinal disease. Um, and as you are all aware, because you fall into that big umbrella, um, these are caused by uh, changes in your genetic code within your DNA. And it leads to those light sensitive cells at the back of the eye, the photoreceptors within the retina degenerating and dying off. We found that the most common inherited retinal disease group amongst these children that were suffering from, um, from Charles Bonnet were in the Stargardt's group. So five patients had confirmed, molecularly confirmed Stargardt's disease with ABCA4 mutations. And as you're aware, it affects the central vision and it can commonly present in childhood and it affects between one in 8,000 to 10,000 individuals. So I just hear, I wonder why these, these, can you guys see these red lines? I'm not sure why they're, they're coming up on my screen, but anyway, just to ignore them. I'm not sure why they're there, but I've got a table up. I don't want you to pay attention to it. It's just mainly for me to kind of go through the details, but these were the five Stargardt's patients um, that had uh, developed Charles Bonnet syndrome. So first was um, a Caucasian male, um, he was between age 20 to 24 years of age when he developed these symptoms. Um, and again, quite poor vision. The next was a, a, a Caucasian female. So again, her age between 20 and 24 when she started to develop the symptoms. And again, could only see the top line of, of the vision chart. Um, another was um, a, a younger male between 10 and 14. Um, again, poor central vision, same for the second male uh, between age 10 to 14. And then there was an, an Asian uh, male between the age of five and nine uh, who developed symptoms of, of Charles Bonnet syndrome. Now, the last three, the younger three children, so the first patient had these simple kind of hallucinations. Um, and what we found was this was detected by a junior doctor in clinic and was just provided verbal information about Charles Bonnet syndrome. The next patient, again, between 10 to 14, that patient actually was experiencing complex hallucinations. So this poor child was seeing menacing faces and faces where their features were really distorted. Um, and he was also from time to time experiencing simple shapes. Now it was an optometrist in the low visual AIDS clinic who had detected this. And this patient was referred to a pediatrician um, and to a counselor. He was advised that he should have kind of quiet time um, at bedtime and was actually was 
experiencing sleep disturbances. So he was actually prescribed melatonin to see if that would generally help with his sleep pattern as well. He was given verbal information about Charles Bonnet syndrome and directed to a support group. And he was advised to contact the GP for further help. But the impact on that child was that he was frightened, he was upset, he had disturbed sleep, and his symptoms featured more frequently at night and it particularly caused him a lot of anxiety and stress. For the younger child who was between, who developed this between age five to nine, there were no real details given in the notes. Again, this was picked up by the optometrist. They were contacted by family support and his main presentation was regular nightmares. So I've just gone into that detail because if any of you are sitting there thinking, actually, you know, my, my child might be experiencing some of these things, it would be worth gently having that conversation to explore it in a little bit more detail. So the impact, so this is for the whole cohort in its entirety. So those patients who were experiencing these complex hallucinations reported that it caused more fear, anxiety, disrupted sleep. Some of them actually complained of a reduced ad appetite and actually that, that some didn't actually want to eat. And it's those people that were actually experiencing visual hallucinations regarding their food. So, you know, creepy crawlies on their plate of food that was actually putting them off and actually pushing them potentially into an eating disorder state. One patient actually dropped out of university because the visual hallucinations were so uh, plaguing that they couldn't cope with concentration, with the workload, with forming relationships with people um, at their university. One patient described uh, the symptoms of not being upsetting or disruptive at all. Um, but more than 50% did say that they felt that it impacted on their lifestyle and well being. Now, adults can usually rationalize these hallucinations, especially if you're aware that this could be a complication of sight loss they can understand that the hallucinations are not real. But from previous case studies, especially children under eight, they can't differentiate whether the hallucination is real or not. And that actually can have a maladaptive response in a child. And so it's really important that we give them support if they are experiencing this. What I would say from experience is that younger people who are experiencing Charles Bonnet syndrome that may not be aware of this would will worry more that they may have a psychiatric problem like schizophrenia. The elderly and older people who may be experiencing that again are not aware of this may worry about general psychosis and dementia, Alzheimer's, and it, or you know you know other other things like you know infection etc so you know it i cannot emphasize enough how important it, it is to just talk about this to to almost normalize it some of these hallucinations can burn out and come to a natural end some can um continue for a number of years uh, there's still a lot of research going into the kind of patterns and habits that that are forming with patients so next steps for all of us, we need to understand how common this is and the true impact and how we can manage our patients. One of the things that we're doing at the moment is undertaking a multi-center national prospective study to understand the prevalence of Charles Bonnet syndrome in our children. And as I said, spread the word. And for any of you uh, who are on this call at the moment and are thinking, actually, I do have this and what can I do? Well, for most of us, it's one, knowing that it exists. That's really good in terms of knowing that you're not kind of losing your mind and that it's nothing more sinister than that. There are simple coping mechanisms. So some of those coping mechanisms include distractive techniques. So for example, if you look from left to right, every kind of 10 seconds, that can actually just jog the hallucination out of your, out of your vision. If you go to do something like, for example, switch the light on, some people hold a torch under their, their chin and switch it on and off a few times and that gets rid of it. Actually trying to touch the hallucination helps because it isn't there. 
it's not real. And so you're almost pushing your brain into an action that is directing its focus on that and therefore displacing the visual hallucination. Now, if there are any of you who have heard about Charles Bonnet, have tried these kind of distractive techniques and you're not, it's not working and it's causing more kind of anxiety, fear, frustration, anger, then there are support groups that you can join. You can contact Esme's umbrella for support at any time. Um, but if it's more serious than that, I would urge you to get in touch with your ophthalmologist, share this with them, because you can be referred further. Um, there are specialists uh, in psychiatry who can just make sure that there isn't anything else going on and then either give you kind of cognitive therapy, that counselling that might kind of help. And there are some drug treatments now that are coming through that may also be able to help too. So we can escalate this in a stepwise ma manner, wh whereby if simple things are not helping, we can actually support you and help you to get more help as, as we move on. So the next thing that we did uh, was over the whole lockdown period, I actually initially in the first lockdown offered to do ask the expert sessions for three UK um, sight loss charities. I offered to do this mainly because I felt that a lot of our patients with uh, genetic eye disease were having their appointments cancelled because you were deemed non-urgent. And, and obviously because of the whole pandemic, we were only allowed to really see emergency patients in the hospitals because we were coping with all the COVID cases. Um, but I also wanted to give people a chance who were not seen at Moorfields to maybe reach out to someone who had an idea about genetics and their condition and to kind of offer a bit of insight into if they needed any extra kind of input. But a lot of the people that contacted me started to describe that their Charles Bonnet syndrome was actually getting much worse. And in some patients to the point at which they wanted to commit suicide. So it was really getting really bad. So I went back to my research team and I actually said that I felt that this area needed a little bit more kind of formal investigation. So what we then did is we basically reached out to 45 patients with established Charles Bonnet syndrome. Um, the mean age was 70 years of, of age and 60% in this cohort were female. And four, over 40% had macular disease of some sort. And we asked them questionnaires to kind of get a better awareness of their hallucinatory experiences um, during that whole lockdown period and what their perceived kind of triggers were for their Charles Bonnet syndrome. And what we found was that 56% of patients uh, reported an increased frequency of their vis visual hallucinations. Close to 50% reported a change in the nature of those hallucinations. They felt that they were becoming more sinister. And over 50% actually reported a change in their emotional response. So they were more fearful and anxious with regards to those hallucinations. Nearly 70% of patients reported greater feelings of loneliness. Um, and despite all of this, 60% had not reached out to support services. So they were just living with this. So the perceived triggers for these increased frequencies were the loneliness, the isolation. Nearly 50% thought it was due to reduced physical exercise. And 30% actually attributed to the chronic depressing news. So the number of COVID deaths, the number of cases going on, the, the continuing lockdown. Um, and 25% thought it was reduced access to healthcare as well. And that kind of, and I did see that, that over the lockdown, a lot of people, you know, because they were isolated, they had a lot more time to kind of reflect on their condition and what was going on with regards to them. And so then getting an appointment canceled by the hospital and not knowing when their next kind of schedule, that actually caused a lot of anxiety for a lot of patients. 
So what can we do to help? Well, staying in touch with each other. And I mean, I'm so pleased that we are now moving out of the lockdown, but we, we're not quite there yet. And, you know, there may be talks of third waves, et cetera. So all I can say is the, the stuff that you guys are doing, Stargarts Connected, literally connecting with each other is so important. Even just regular coffee mornings, virtual ones, giving, you know, relatives a phone call just to say, hey, how are you? It's so important getting involved with community support groups from a hospital point of view. You know, I, I didn't cancel any of my patients over the whole COVID period. I converted to virtual contact, even just a simple telephone call from a genetic counselor or an eye clinic liaison officer to check that you're okay is really important. And then if any of you are feeling vulnerable and in that position to, to reach out to the charity helpline. So for Charles Bonnet, Esme's umbrella is fantastic it offers support counseling advice it will get you connected to people who who you need to be connected with the rnib have um support lines retin uk have a buddying system macular society and i'm sure stargarts connected have have things in place for you too so just i want to just have an interim thank you at this point for um the main people that helped me with this study. So Dr. Lee Jones, an amazing psychologist um, who was involved in, and kind of run the study, which is now published in the British Journal of Ophthalmologist. Laurel Ditzel Finn, who is uh, an eye clinic liaison officer at Great Ormond Street, um, who collected a lot of the data and the amazing Judith Potts, who runs Esme's Umbrella. And thank you to Thomas Pocklington Trust that um, supported this and the welcome and um, the NIHR Biomedical Research Centre at Moorfields and UCL Institute of Ophthalmology. So um, I'm, I'm going to be moving on to gene vision, but maybe this is probably a natural pause for Charles Bonnet questions. If Andy, what do you think? If yeah, there are any, or I could keep going. No, we've got a couple, if you don't yeah. mind, Maria. Um, so I'm just going to read what's been put in the chat so far. Um, so um, one person has said they um, they have a child who has described seeing hallucinations, um, but has also described hearing voices instructing um, them to hurt themselves. And are these linked to Charles Bonnet syndrome, or do you think the voices are more of a mental health issue? So that's that's how old it, do would we? And I suppose do we 11, know? They'll be eleven shortly. Okay, and they've got star guards. Yes. So it's really difficult, isn't it? I mean, what I would say is that the hallucinations may be due to the star guards, but the fact that they are anxious and scared and maybe depressed could be leading to those thoughts coming in. And again, with children, it's really tricky to know if it's their inner voice or if they're hearing an external voice. What I would say is that I would definitely 100% go and seek help for this. I, I would go to your GP and explain what's going on um, because I think when you are having thoughts about self-harm, there is a bigger issue going on um, that, that does need proper investigation. Uh, so that would be my advice here. But yeah, I mean, the hallucinations, you know, very well could be due to, to this. Now, I had a young child in clinic last Friday who was seeing spiders on the floor and bumblebees cl quite close to their face. Now, he was saying that he could touch them, but the mother wasn't sure that it was that or it was the, the fact that he was trying to push the bee away. Um, for that case, it's difficult because, again, he said he could see that, you know, he could he could see the spiders on his chest. And so he's going to try to, you know, rub his his chest to get it off his clothes. Is that him feeling it or is it? that he's seeing it and, and responding to it. So it's really difficult with children to tease this out. But I would say in that case, it was Charles Bonnet. But when it comes to self-harm, what's happening is you can't tease out whether it's a response to the sight loss and to, to po possibly visual hallucinations as two separate things, 
or if it's something completely different. I hope that helps, but please do seek help. Thank you, Maria. Um, the next questions we have are specifically around shapes and lines um, and light. So I think we all kind of fit together. So um, some people have described seeing shapes or lines in their periphery from time to time and whether that would be Charles Bonnet. And a number of people have reported that they see lights um, in their vision, um, green wiggly lines, purple or blue flashes, particularly when they're tired. Could these be Charles Bonnet syndrome or, or perhaps an, another symptom of Sargas? Okay, so it's really important that um, you know that when when the so okay the, sometimes the eye can get different um sensations and 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 light sensations especially when you're suffering from sight loss your eyes will never create colored visual symptoms okay so i'm going to take a step back when you have an inherited retinal disease and the cells are potentially dying off, you can almost get a flickering effect. Okay, and that's that's common. And I've I've seen I've, I've seen loads of patients who report this. They just almost get a flickering, and it is almost like the cells that are not working very well are kind of sending off this kind of abnormal discharge signal. Then you've got patients that actually develop flashing lights when their retina is being tugged now this is something else so as you get old, older you get you we all have a jelly in the center of our eyeball that is attached to various places in our retina and as we get older that jelly starts to shrink it starts to lose its kind of moisture and it's tugging on the retina and when it tugs on the retina you can get these flashing lights in the periphery that flash but really they are just occasional flashes. If you ever got persistent flashes for more than an hour, we would actually tell you to come into accident and emergency to get checked to make sure that you haven't actually got a retinal tear or ret retinal detachment. So that's one thing. And I don't think that's what, what's being described here. The other thing to say is that we sometimes get black floaters in our vision. And again, what that is, is depending on which angle you have in your eyes you get light coming through and it hits the jelly in your eyes and especially on white backgrounds you can get these black floaters that's just due to optics essentially all of these are natural phenomenon that can go on because of physical things in the eye anything that's purple green any color apart from black zigzaggy lines that's usually from the brain so i would say to anyone who's got those atypical type of shapes or lines or colored lights that's more coming from the brain and so in my opinion yes that is probably a form of charles bonnet syndrome sometimes you get migraines i suffer from migraines um, and my migraine starts at the center. And the first time I ever had it, I was on the computer and I couldn't focus on the words that I was typing. I just couldn't see the word. And then it almost became a zigzaggy line that, that started going out in a spiral and I could see it. So that's, that's, vis that's kind of a visual aura before a migraine. So I, I would just say that, you know, if you know you're getting migraines and headaches like that, you should be seeing a GP about that. If you're getting these kind of purple, green colored lights and the shapes and things like that, I, I would definitely say that's more likely to be um, Charles Bonnet syndrome. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Maria. And we've got a thank you in the in the message in the chat, sorry, um, for that response. So thank you very much. We've got about 10, 15 minutes left, Maria, if you want to move, move on to your next bit. Brilliant. OK, so I'm just going to minimize you guys and go next. So. So the next part of the talk I wanted to tell you about was uh, Gene Vision, which is a website that I have poured a lot of my kind of heart and soul into over the last two years. And it was launched on the 1st of December uh, last year. 
Um, it is a, I think, a brilliant website, which is essentially made for all of you. It is a web resource on rare genetic eye disorders, literally for everyone. So healthcare professionals and for patients. Um, it's reliable. It's written and edited by specialists, mainly at Moorfields, um, and actually re-edited by patients and charity groups. It's got all the relevant information about your condition, the latest research, and it explains it in, in a lay language, which you will be able to access and understand. But importantly, it's an absolute reflection to what the entry is for healthcare professionals. Um, so, and you can even access the health, health healthcare professional page if you want to kind of just make sure that the detail is, is there for, for, from both sides. There's a huge section on the kind of practical aspects of, of sight loss. So there's a coping with losing your vision area. It talks about Charles Bonnet education, driving employment, family support, and there are all the links to all the relevant organizations and charities. And what we made sure was this was very, very patient friendly. We actually had patient focus groups um, that were run um, at Moorfields and the Institute of Ophthalmology, where we brought patients with all levels of visual impairment, parents of children uh, with inherited retinal diseases. Um, and we actually got two uh, digital accessibility consultants, but one who's deaf blind and the other one who's got a genetic eye disease to essentially work with us to make sure the site um, is compatible with all kinds of speech programs. Um, and it's been tested on, on a number of patients. We would like to kindly thank the sponsorship of Retina UK and again, the NIHR uh, BRC at Moorfields for essentially helping to fund this amazing resource. So this is the page, which I'm actually going to go live to it in a moment, but this is just a screenshot of the page. If you were to type in Stargardt's disease, you will come up with Stargardt's disease for patients. Um, and the things that are listed here is an overview on the condition, any of the kind of management and treatment that we offer at the moment, current research into Stargardt's disease, practical advice, how to get a referral to a specialist center for genetic testing and specialist input, further information and support, patient's perspectives, references on some of the key papers, and then a link to the professional page, which is um, ABCA4 retinopathy. So um, I know that there are some people that are new to Stargardt's connected on the call. And uh, I was asked by Andy and Bhavna just to talk a little bit about the genetics of Stargardt's. Now, the most common genetic cause of Stargardt's disease is a gene called ABCA4. Now, this is actually in inherited in something called an autosomal recessive manner. Now, just to start with the very basics, when you have a child, dad will give half of his genes and mum will give half of their genes. So every, every individual has two copies of every gene, one from mum and one from dad. Now, if the parents of a patient, um, they appear completely healthy, but actually with the most commonest form of Stargardt's, this ABCA4, that the father will have a good copy of that gene and a bad copy of the gene. In the same respect, the mum will also have a good copy and a bad copy of that gene. Bad copy meaning that there is a mutation in that particular gene, which means that it's not functioning properly. Now, because both the parents have a good copy, that good copy is strong enough to override the, the bad copy and the parents don't have any problems at all with their sight. They're otherwise healthy, but they are carriers of that bad copy. And when they go on to have a child, unfortunately, they have a 25% chance of passing those two bad copies to a future child. And if a child inherits, inherits two bad copies, then they will go on to develop Stargardt's disease. Equally, those parents may have an unaffected child, but there is a 50% chance that that unaffected child may be a carrier of that condition. 
and a 25% chance that their children may be completely normal, unaffected and have two healthy copies of the gene. Now the carriers won't have a problem unless when they go on to have a family in the future, if they marry someone within their family who may appear healthy, but also may be a carrier, or they marry someone who has a history of, for example, Stargardt's or a retinal disease in their family, in which case then we would have to look into genetic testing um, at, to, to kind of decipher what's going on there. I would just say to anyone again listening, if you have a child that is, for example, you have a child that has Stargardt's, but you also have another child that appears healthy, we do not do genetic testing on healthy children because at the moment it's still unethical to, to do a genetic test on them. What we would say is once they become adults and they want to go on to start a family, then we are very happy to undertake kind of genetic testing to see if they're a carrier of the gene or not. And then, you know, please get them to refer to see someone like myself or any of the other genetic consultants. But as a child, we can't, we can't test that unless they start to show symptoms. Now, if you're a patient yourself, or you've got a child with style guts and you're worried about how they would transmit that in the future, well, they will pass on one bad copy of the gene to their future children because they have two bad copies, they've got no choice. But as long as their child, uh, rather their partner, again, is completely unrelated to the family and has no history of any eye diseases as such, any, anything like Stargardt's, then that partner will likely pass on a healthy copy of the gene. And therefore, the children of a patient will be a carrier, but they will not develop the condition themselves. So that's autosomal recessive inheritance. And that is the most common form of inherited Stargardt's disease caused by the ABCA4 gene. Now, there are two other genes that are known to cause Stargardt's much, much more rarely, um, but there, there is a gene called ELOVL4 and PROM1. And these are two genes that are known to cause macular dystrophies that have very similar features to Stargardt's disease. Uh, and these are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. So just to go over autosomal dominant inheritance. So we know that every individual is made up of two copies of a gene, one from mum and one from dad. Now, if one of those genes has a mutation in the PROM1 gene, for example, the nature of this is that the mutated gene, the bad copy this time is so strong that the good copy can't override it. And so that individual will develop the disease, even just with one bad copy. Now, sometimes you get families where they say, well, my mom and dad are completely healthy. There is a phenomenon with dominant diseases whereby patients or individuals can hold a bad copy of the gene, but not display the condition. This is called non-penetrance or variable expressivity. It makes autosomal dominant inheritance quite complex. It does exist. And, you know, sometimes when we look at the parents' um, genetics, we see that actually, yeah, that, the, for example, the father did have that gene, but for whatever reason, he didn't display the condition. But most commonly, when we check the parents of an affected patient and they, if the parents were healthy, they didn't carry the genetic change. And that means that the genetic mutation arose when the child was basically a ball of cells in the womb. The change occurred within that baby themselves. So they were the starting point of that genetic change. But it means that future generations have a 50% chance of essentially inheriting that change. That means that it, irregardless of whether they're a boy or a girl, that particular child has a 50% risk of developing um, Stargardt's if they inherit that bad copy. So that is what autosomal dominant inheritance is. Now, 
all of that draws to the importance of genetic testing. Now, again, if any of you are sitting on this call and you haven't had genetic testing yet, I cannot labor the point enough that this is hugely important for all of you. The reason is I can guarantee that most of you will want to know the cause of this, especially if you've just had a child with this. Most parents or all people who come to my clinic have two questions. The first is, what was the cause of this? Why did it happen? And the second question very swiftly after is, is there a treatment? Now, by doing genetic testing, it can help me find the cause of this condition for you. Yes, you can be labeled with Stargardt's, but it isn't, isn't until you get that molecular diagnosis that we can 100% confirm that this is the cause. And there are a lot of doctors out there that may not be familiar with these rare genetic retinal conditions, and they may label people with conditions that actually aren't exactly what they really are. We are now moving towards a genetic classification for patients because that's how we understand disease processes and can provide gene-based treatments to people. And I, and I highlight this with a clear example that involves Stargardt's patients. So about 30 years ago, um, a scientist found that vitamin A was important with the visual cycle. And so then loads of kind of eye doctors started to tell patients to take vitamin A supplements because, because it was really good for their vision, because it was linked with the visual cycle. And this was back in the day when anyone who had some sort of retinal problem was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa as a blanket diagnosis. So then all these poor patients started to take vitamin A supplements. And then a large group of these patients started to lose more vision. And that was the group with Stargardt's and ABCA4 mutations. And that's because too much vitamin A was causing toxicity in the retina and was making the cells die faster because the nature of the genetic mutation was that it couldn't break down that, that buildup of toxic product. And so it's important, and I know people have told you this many times before, but it's important that patients with Stargots do not take excessive vitamin A in their diets. And it's important that we know what genes are causing your condition so we can give you that appropriate advice. Then obviously, genetic testing will help with um, informed genetic counseling. So we can tell you your risk of having another child with this. We can tell the patient the risk of having future children with this. We can offer you family planning. Now on the NHS, there are things like pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is a form of IVF, which is essentially where we can take the sperm and the eggs from, from a partner's. We can fertilize it in, a, in the laboratory. And then we can take a, a single cell once it's an early ball of cells, a blastocyst, and check whether that embryo is carrying two mutations in the ABCA4 gene. If it is, then we would discard those embryos, but we would implant the healthy embryos back. And so you then know that you won't be passing this on to future children. There's also non-invasive uh, prenatal testing, which is where we can now take a blood sample from a pregnant mother and check whether the fetus, we can get the fetus DNA from the blood sample and see again if the fetus is carrying the genetic changes or not. And then it's up to the couple whether or not they, they want to proceed or, or make other decisions. The other reason for genetic testing for people like myself is for the development of treatments so we can understand the, why that gene's working, to call, how it works to cause disease and how it works in normal health. And then for you as patients, access to the number of clinical trials that now are available for, for Stargardt's patients. Oh, so yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm coming to an end now. Lovely. <laughs> so, so just to say that uh, if you do have any other questions and you want to contact me, um, my uh, email address is m.musji at nhs.net and Bhavna, Andy can pass that on to you. So just very lastly, I'm going to end, but I'm just going to quickly jump on to um, G. 
gene vision, if that is okay. So there we go. So this is the website. I hope you can see that. So all you have to do in your browser is type in gene.vision, or you can also type that into um, Google and it will come up. And this is basically the page that you will land on. So all you have to do is navigate and you will be able to, with all speech softwares, to the search box. And if you type in Stargarts, it will automatically, uh, I was thinking, there we go, Stargardt's disease. Stargardt's disease for patients comes up straight away and you can click on that. And it comes to that page, which I talked about. And if you scroll down, it will give you an overview and this is all written. So hopefully you will understand everything that's there. But if you, for example, wanted to know more about photoreceptors or the ABCA4 gene or the macula, these things are, are highlighted so that you can actually link in and learn more about it. It goes through the symptoms that you will be experiencing, the cause, how it can be diagnosed. It's got pictures of, of what it looks like at the back of the eye. Um, it talks about the inheritance patterns, talks about kind of supportive measures um, that should be offered to patients, um, uh, optimization for, for uh, ensuring children develop fully despite having Stargardt's. And then it talks about some of the current research. So the trials that are underway and actually has the links to those particular trials. So you can go and have a look at those. You can learn more. And often on clinicaltrials.gov, uh, when you link to a trial, there will be contact details in, you know, if you scroll down eligibility criteria so you can get in touch with people. But just a warning that some of the trials on that website are not always ethically approved. Um, we have had cases of patients who have contacted some of the trial coordinators for some stem cell trials and recruited in and then actually lost vision. So before you kind of jump in all kind of gung ho, it's really important that you consult with your ophthalmologist first to ask, oh, I, I noticed this. Is this actually a valid trial? You know, do you think it would be worth me contacting them just to kind of get the thumbs up on that? So it gives you a link about that and it just gives you a lot more kind of information about gene therapies, what's under, underway for other inherited retinal diseases. It talks about some of the um, advances in stem cell treatments and links and then practical advice, um, how to get referred and all the kind of information and support and stuff. And then just, just very briefly at the top, so there's a tab called information and support. You can just follow it down in your own time. You know, it tells you about the eye, the anatomy of it, coping with sight loss, the role of eye clinic liaison officers, the education, employment, all those kind of social aspects of support. And then if you scroll along again, there's a genetics tab, which will go into detail about genetic counseling, family planning, um, actual genetic testing, inheritance patterns. Um, and then the research tab is really interesting because it will actually go through the concepts of research um, and the stuff that is underway and being developed for you. So it will talk to you about the principles of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing or gene therapies. And there's an opportunity as well um, to actually uh, register for any research opportunities that may be involved um, at Moorfields. And if you just click back on the logo, you go back to the main site if you want to contact us, then you can do so. You just click on that um, and you can fill out your name and your email. You can say what condition you have and say that you'd like to receive updates or not and put any messages in. And that actually comes to an email that um, I uh, control. So I, I can feed back to you on that. So I think with that, I'm going to let you guys play around with it. But I'd love to have any feedback from any of you um, in due course. Thank you very much. I hope I hope that was helpful. Thank you, Marie. I think that was really, really helpful. Um, I know you've got to disappear like imminently. But no, 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 it's fine. I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm happy okay. to stay for a little bit longer. Yeah. Thank you so much. We've got one question that's come in on the chat so far. And somebody was asking, does stem cell therapy help treating Stargardt's disease? 
So interestingly, uh, they did a trial at Moorfields actually a few years ago, uh, where they um, basically wanted to see if injecting stem cells into the retina was safe and if there was any kind of benefit. Um, I think they concluded that it was safe, but there was no visual benefit and they never progressed further than that. Um, the issue there is, is that, and I, I think you'll appreciate this, Stargardt's along with all the other inherited retinal diseases is a chronic progressive disorder. And so the cells are slowly dying off and you're not having the right connections there. The, 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 the few, I, I, well, I think we have to add in a year for everything now because of COVID. So everything was a couple of years ago, but you will remember there was on the front page of the newspaper, stem cells cure for blindness. And that was um, a study which they again did at Moorfields where they took two patients who had um, age-related macular degeneration, a, a, a fresh bleed at the back of their eye, and they were treated with stem cells within 12 to 24 hours. Now, that's a very different situation from a Stargardt's patient because there, they essentially had normal retinal structure and there was just a bleed and they injected in um, some cells that almost formed like a patch. And then when the blood resolved, the eye was actually able to continue to work properly. With Stargardt's, the light sensitive cells have, have died and probably the mother layer, the retinal pigment epithelial have as well. So if you inject stem cells, the issue is, is that at the moment, our cells make these very defined connections. But if you if they die and you inject another cells, cells in, are they actually making the right connections and therefore are they actually working? Those, those absolute ideal connections are probably not there. And so we need to do a little bit more work to kind of work out how best to use stem cells. So I would say we still have a lot more time before we can rush into that aspect in patients. Thanks, Maria. And unsurprisingly, the other conversation that comes up is what about gene therapy and AAV vectors and dual therapy AAV? Yeah, so obviously the, the problem with AAVs at the moment is that they only hold genes which are around four and a half thousand letters inside in size. And I know that the, the ABCA4 gene is much bigger than that capacity. So the standard conventional AAV vector that is used for Luxterna for the RP65 treatment won't help here, but there is work being done on this dual vector system. Um, I'm not sure it has gone to clinical trials yet. They're still certainly doing a lot of work in mouse models. Um, just to say that uh, my particular research group is working on a non-viral gene therapy. Um, basically, it uses a, a plasmid, a DNA backbone. So same sort of DNA as you get in your own cells, um, but it has the capacity to hold genes of any size. And the, the biggest size gene that it is held in the past is 135,000 letters. So the ABCA4 gene would fit very easily into this vector system. And it doesn't have any viral components. So it's thought to be much more um, safer, less of an immune response when you inject it in. But we're still in very kind of what we call preclinical um, phase development at the moment. We're actually trying to develop it for, for another condition called Usher syndrome, which actually has a bigger gene than uh, the ABCA4. And we're trying to see if that as a proof of principle will work, but that potentially has the ability to be applied to the Stargardt's gene and, and help in the future. And, and the other good thing about those vectors is that, as we know, AAV vectors, you can only at the moment inject it as a one-off. Um, and that partly is because we don't know what the immune response will be if you gave a second injection. Um, so these developing these kind of alternative vector systems are going to be good for the future because if AAVs didn't work, then you may have a backup of something to be able to top up, top, top up later. Thank you so much, Maria. I think that, ah, one final question. Um, does, the length of, does the length of time you've had the condition make a difference on potential treatment? So, 
I think I think it's very important to understand that if your cell has died already, uh, these kind of treatments at the moment will not bring that cell back to life again. So, but we know with Stargardt's, obviously the peripheral vision is, is relatively well preserved. Even with patients where their central vision have gone, so for example, in the croideremia, and in, even with the RP65 patients now, where the, the kind of central vision is really poor, but they still have these islands of peripheral vision, there is now thoughts that actually giving a gene therapy where there is still functioning retina will help patients. So I think we are now moving to the point where actually, yes, you know, even if you've got some preserved vision, it's worth preserving that vision. Obviously, the younger you are, the less vision you've lost, the less kind of cells that you've lost, the better for you. So the earlier treatment's even better. And actually what we want to do is kind of think about ways to prevent further sight loss until those stem cells are, are kind of working and are effective and can kind of give vision back. I think the best option we have is to prevent further sight loss. So the earlier, the better. The problem that some of you may face is that for, for example, some of the, the clinical trials, um, the, the kind of the people running them may want people with more vision so that they can see a benefit from it. Um, but once these treatments do become available on the NHS, I think there is no reason, as long as, as, as I said, you have some cells that are still providing some level of vision, why you could not access that. That would be my, I mean, I, 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 I would like to be able to provide a treatment to every single one of you if I could, so. Thank you so much, Maria. I think that's a really lovely point to end on so I just want to say thank you so much for coming and joining us today it's um I think really fascinating to hear from an expert and to have, you know and you've been so generous with what you've been able to share so I'm sure sorry, there are sorry many... Andy um I had yeah. one sorry um Maria, so I've got one question that was sent in to me previously that was email can I is it all right it's, it's sort yes, of cool. genetic testing um so yes yeah, so this was I think you've kind of covered this. She's um, the lady said there were she knows that there's various versions of Stargardt's disease. Um, would it be an advantage to, for an individual to have up to date genetic testing to find out which one they have, and if yes, how to go about it? So, um, in terms of how would you organise to get a genetic testing done if you haven't got one already? That would probably be the question that a lot of people are probably asking anyway. Okay, so there, the, I mean, for for patients in the UK, the obviously the easiest thing is. I mean, there is no reason why anyone in the UK should not have had genetic testing. But I do appreciate that depending where you live, your the access to what's being offered to you can be very variable. So if any of you are sitting there and haven't had genetic testing, I would just ask your GP to either refer you to more fields, because now what we're doing, especially because of the pandemic, um, if you're in Manchester, although you could go to Manchester because they would absolutely offer it to you, but okay, let's say you're in Hull, for example, um, we can now do it all remotely. So we can have a, we can have a virtual conversation with you um, and we pretty much will know that you've got Stargardt's from the history and stuff and also the referral letter. Um, and we can actually send a blood pack to you and then you can go to your GP or the practice nurse, get your blood done and send back to us and we can start processing that. And in some cases, we may even be happy just to deliver the results back to you virtually as well. So that's what I would do for um, the people in the UK, just get a GP referral to get genetic testing. Um, you can go to that, you know, again, go to the Gene Vision website. It does tell you the genetic um, uh, clinics around the UK because there may be one closer to you. So there's Manchester, Leeds, um, uh, Southampton, or you know, all over Oxford, Birmingham, etc. For those of you outside of the UK, um, so <laughs> I don't know. It's a bit more difficult, isn't it? We can organise privately for you to have genetic testing. Um, and certainly I, I actually spoke to someone who may be on this call actually today, just earlier this week. 
um, where anyone in the world, if you haven't had it, you can have again a virtual consultation and we can send a saliva kit out to wherever you are and you can have your genetic results done within, you know, four to six weeks. So there are ways of doing it. So if there is anyone on the call that wants wants to go that way, then again, just send me an email and we can help you with that. But for the for the NHS patients, absolutely um, just get a GP referral is, is really important. Brilliant. Thank uh, you. It's really helpful. Uh, anything else, Bob, now? No, that's it. That's the, that's the only one. So thanks. Lovely. Well, thank you so much, Maria. Really appreciated you having with us and we hope you'll come back to another meeting again in the future. Um, oh, I would love to. Fun. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Sorry for talking too much. <laughs> I don't think, no, it doesn't look like anybody is worried about that. So thank you so much. So everybody, oh. we are now going to take a short break. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Thank you, really Have a good weekend and a happy Easter. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. bye. bye.